We're set. Thank you very much. That's, uh, all right. Hopefully you're looking at what I'm looking at. Uh, what we have here is uh, dynamic collections through annotation. Uh, it, it, as, as I said in the abstract, this is all about uh, implementation. It's about the interoperability part of IIIF. Uh, I'm always struck by how much we can come together and talk about interoperability, but a lot of the uh, success stories of IIIF surround the uh, large repositories or the places where all the collections are held together in one place. Uh, and that makes it a little bit harder here. Um, so what I'm going to show you today are uh, some real cases of, of things that we've done and what has sort of made that happen. Uh, goals for today, what is a collection? Uh, I think that's uh, important to identify. What is a list? How do you create them? What, is that, what does that mean? And uh, hopefully some of the solutions that uh, I've come up with. There's nothing in here that's going to be uh, uh, earth shattering. Uh, I don't think any of you are gonna wake up the kids to come see the rest of the presentation. Uh, but I do think it's important to see things that have worked actually working uh, and to learn some of the lessons alongside. Uh, so that's what we're going to get into. Talking about collections first, uh, there's two main types of collections that I tend to come across. It's either things like this uh, or it is similar things. And there's a subtle difference between those, uh, but the idea is that you're, you're either taking some kind of uh, trait or reason for curation and gathering together those things, or you have a bunch of things and you've done some kind of clustering with them and there's a reason why they're similar. Uh, collections also has a very specific meaning uh, in IIIF. Uh, they're used to list the manifests available for viewing. So, uh, even though a collection has a very real uh, meaning in the real world, it's often the case that uh, in, when you get technical with things, it becomes a lot more abstract and a lot emptier. So a collection or a manifest is just an empty container uh, to most developers who are working with it. Uh, there's a convenience to it, but it is just a list, really. Uh, so a list is a set of things. That's clear enough. And there are ways to identify what those things are. Uh, we have a couple of different uh, things here that, that go back. Uh, IIIF uh, has a collection. Uh, there are also collections and lists and things that we've seen in lots of other uh, schemata. When we get to dynamic lists, we're talking more about uh, things that we're trying to assemble from somewhere else or things that may be uh, updating as, as we generate these lists. If we go back to the idea of those collections, uh, we're either setting that key trait that they all have in common and letting things add themselves to that list if they share that trait, uh, or we're basing some sort of uh, algorithm of similarity to uh, what we already have in the collection and seeing if other things happen to enter into it. Uh, this is very simple to do when you control everything. Uh, and it's very simple when you only need to be able to access your own items. But it gets a lot more complicated if you have a small team uh, and they want to share, not only sharing resources uh, from remote places into their collection, but then sharing that collection back out as well. The goal is to belong to more than one and not be destructive. Uh, so the way that uh, I've implemented this in places where we've used it, and I'll show you some examples of those, uh, are looking at these, uh, these three, and there are certainly more. This is just some example. Uh, within the schema, schema, uh, <laughs> schema.org, uh, target collection is a very convenient one that is an annotation you can put on an individual item, whether or not you own that item. Uh, and it just says that this target belongs to this other collection. You can certainly generate a collection completely ad hoc uh, by saying, I want a collection of all items I can find anywhere on the linked open data graph that have a date of June 6, 1974. Uh, but doing that gives you a lot less control over what's actually showing up in your web application or your uh, quasi catalog or, or whatever it is that you're working with. Um, 
So having something like an explicit annotation that says this is the target collection uh, works really well. Part of does something very similar and part of uh, in DC terms is used by IIIF uh, as well if you're talking about uh, membership of items. Part of is also how you can identify a uh, canvas as being part of a manifest, for example. So it's the way for things to uh, note their parent. What's exciting about that is that you can be part of more than one thing, just as you can have more collections that, that gather you. Uh, this really came up in uh, a project that we were working with where we were going through uh, the Jesuit archives and finding records of enslaved peoples. And not surprisingly, there were not a lot of traditional records for uh, the various enslaved peoples. They showed up in a lot of other collections. Uh, so we, we were going into things like uh, bills of sale and ledgers or uh, diary reports from you know, field production, uh, things like uh, discipline entries or uh, uh, manifests from trips that were taken. Uh, that would that would list the sort of cargo and include uh, an entity that was an enslaved person. So we had to find a way to extract those people from those collections and recollect them in a new place. Um, but we also wanted to be able to do that without breaking the original collection. Uh, you can imagine if any of you work with uh, archives, uh, they, they get very nervous when you start talking about moving things around. So being non-destructive is very important. Uh, it's the item in this case that belongs to the collection, not the other way around. So we're not creating that, uh, that pot and just putting things into it uh, in one way. We're actually creating this as an abstract. When you use schema target collection, you don't actually have to have that collection exist anywhere. As long as all the items that share uh, whatever the predicate of target collection is, uh, then you have a collection. Uh, it just happens. So first thing you have to do is find the digital resource. Uh, there are a lot of other sessions on this and IIIF has worked on it. Uh, people in research have worked on it. Uh, finding something that's uh, digital is tricky, uh, but you do have some options. And then you gather others together. Uh, when you start gathering them, uh, the, the challenge is that you start to find resources in different places. You decorate those with annotations by saying, uh, now I'm going to assert about this digital resource that it's part of this collection. And as soon as you've done that to more than one thing, you've started to build a dynamic collection. Uh, usually there's software involved, uh, something that you have to do in the middle. Uh, there are certainly uh, helpers. Uh, there are things, uh, exhibit tools that make it very easy to uh, exhibit your collection or to work with a collection. Uh, but there's almost always some kind of software involved to do the, the munging between. And then if it's something you're sharing with somebody else, you need to find a way to render it in a web application, uh, serve it uh, at, at an endpoint, or have some place for this collection to be rediscovered by somebody else. Creates a lot of problems. Uh, you can have uh, trouble with filtering, missing results. Uh, the dates, labels, formats never match exactly right. You can have uh, things that uh, don't exist or don't have authority files. Uh, so in the example of the uh, enslaved peoples, we had to generate uh, an ID for each of the entities that we found. Each of those people uh, you know, don't, don't have a VIAF entry. So if we want to refer to them reliably, uh, we need to start creating some of those additional resources. So even though uh, a collection can be made very non-destructively, it, it, it's also very generative. In order to fill in those gaps, there's a lot of new assertions that need to be made. Sometimes those are descriptive annotations, uh, and sometimes those are entirely new digital uh, entities that help bridge some of the gaps in those relationships. Uh, and then finally, you get into uh, the, yeah, you, you get uh, things that change. Uh, if you're collecting other things and you're creating these, uh, these annotations, then you're not in control of the original object. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a very realistic anxiety about that. Uh, it, it's very practical uh, to have that fear, but it, at some point my sense is uh, until people who are hosting all of these things recognize how important they are, uh, then we, we, we start to lose things from it. Um, 
it's possible to mirror all of these things. I, I prefer not to when I, when I can avoid it. One of the nice things about collecting things in this way is that once you've decorated things with annotations, the annotations themselves can mirror some of the metadata. Uh, they might be doing things like adjusting a date range that's listed in a mods record uh, into an annotation that has uh, more clear start and stop dates or uh, searchable dates for an item. So even if that original record disappears, you've still created a silhouette of that object in the collection. And it still belongs to the collection, even if it can't be found. Uh, and this is the same thing that's happened historically, uh, as people have, uh, you know, if we find a, a, a hand list of, uh, uh, you know, old plays by an author, we might only have the manuscripts for a third of those plays, but we know that the rest of them existed because of that collection document. Uh, so I'm going to go into some examples of what we've uh, accomplished so far, some of the things that we've put together, and show you how these collections can look very different and uh, why it's useful. Let me grab the, the put the Q&A up as well, so we can go through some of that. If you have any, uh, please drop them in there. And let me pop over to, so the first one we have here is called Glossy Matthew. Uh, it's a, a project looking at commentary and glosses and uh, manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew and uh, trying to make connections between them. Uh, this is an interesting collection because we have already uh, in our center a T Pen transcription platform, and it's possible to do most of the transcription within T Pen. We create those annotations there. Uh, but what we needed was a, a sort of project portal uh, for the, the students and the uh, graduate assistants and the, and the scholars to work together and start to identify which manuscripts belong to this collection. Uh, so this is an example of, of these together here. Uh, and if I pull one up, uh, you can see all of this information that's coming in is annotation uh, that is that is putting these together. And in this case, uh, what I'm using to generate this form is our own internal uh, and publicly shared uh, on GitHub uh, DEER uh, uh, framework, which uh, creates a form in which the item that we are referring to is annotated with all of the values that we've put into the form. Those annotations are stored in our, our rear and public uh, open annotation store as well. So you have options for that. Oh, Brian's here filling in. Way to go, buddy. Uh, <laughs> so this, is, this gives us the opportunity to uh, add information that we didn't have before. So there is a manifest here uh, that's, that's being hosted at Cambridge Digital Libraries. And I can pull that up here. And we get a lot of great metadata that is associated with it. And we can bring in any metadata that matches already uh, the things that we're looking for. Uh, but when there are things that uh, we don't have, uh, for example, in this case, we wanted a simple century uh, date identifier, and that didn't exist. Um, we also need a base project in the TPEN platform that's connected to it. Uh, that gives us the transcription. So we can go into a gloss now, which is another project we've identified with this. And it has its own annotations. It has uh, a different set of things. And we can get everything we want about it out of the TPEN project. And so we're looking at all of this data, all of this information uh, from the original resources. In this case, it's the Cambridge Digital Library, uh, the Rarum uh, Annotation Store, and the uh, TPEN uh, manifest that's being served. So all of these are together. Uh, if we were to look at one of these uh, uh, projects specifically here, if I go to view manuscripts, you'll see as it loads. Uh, first, I can tell you that there are 17 things in this, and I've uh, this is uh, this is on our dev server, so we've got this a little throttled, so you can see it come in. And what we're actually loading here is searching uh, in Rerum for the annotations that say target collection, uh, then whatever this is called, Glossy Matthew, let's say, uh, and then. Within this entry, it's finding the label for each item uh, or the sigla for each item and popping it in the front. And then it's looking for an annotation of the label uh, or failing to find that it's downloading the manifest and then reading the label out of it and putting it in here. Uh, for IIIF objects, that works really well. Uh, for an object that doesn't have a IIIF manifest, oh, this one does, whoops. <laughs> 
Well, let's pretend it doesn't. Uh, many of these do not have IIIF manifests associated with them, which means that the data that's in the catalog either needs to come out as a uh, specific kind of XML resource that we're going to read into this, or it's just not accessible. Uh, it's only available in that web view, which means that the researcher can actually add those annotations here, even if they're duplicates of what would be available at the source. And that link then becomes uh, uh, available to the rest of the manuscripts and, and those that, that information as well. So uh, the images and things may be uh, hosted somewhere else that we can bring them in just as images and work them into TPEN. TPEN then becomes our proxy to share that uh, those images in a manifest, even if they're not IIIF image compliant, they're now IIIF presentation compliant. So this exact same platform uh, has been used uh, with the, the new uh, Dayton Dunbar Library and Archive, which is uh, Paul Dunbar, poet, and his environs. And there's a lot more that's coming together here, but they had a very similar case where they needed to be able to put together a, a collection. So all you have to do is add something to the collection and it pops in and becomes part of what you're working with. Uh, this combination of, uh, of tools, uh, Deer and Rerum, has allowed even one of our less technical professors to generate a thing he calls the Fiantinator. Uh, we have a, refinance, a fancy Fiant Finagler for making Meg more marketable. Uh, Meg is his research assistant and he's taking Irish Fiants and going into them and identifying information about them and then creating entities for the people who are associated with them. So you can find what some of these have uh, quite a few people associated with them, uh, a lot of description, and he's just encoding all of this data out of the text that he has. Uh, but this collection here of fiance is created uh, in that dynamic way. This is a much more complex uh, user interface. This technically still uses Deer, but uh, Brian Haberberger has done a great job making it uh, much more usable. And these collections are being found the same way. So to add a location, you're adding it to the collection of live for religion locations. And this list is generated then dynamically. That allows you to have views like this as well. You can change the visualization of whatever it is you're bringing in by searching for things the same way. Patrick, real quick, just to say, we got about one minute left. Um, if there's any last bit you want to cover here. Yes. I'll pop back here. Um, so these are the things that, that are, are worth considering. Uh, when you have hybrid solutions, you can actually uh, leave things where they are and then work and add with what you have. Um, the other way to do this, uh, as you saw things coming in slowly when we were on our dev server to avoid some of those resources, you can have in the data entry side of things, a much more dynamic list and then create a place where you uh, uh, calcify that or release that into a single list that identifies all the things at that point, which means you can start pushing out to the next one. Uh, so in our live religion platform, the public version of that won't use a dynamic list to pull all of those objects and all of those experiences and all of those locations together. We'll have a single list that'll be moderated by the project managers to say, this is the public list, and then you're set. Uh, find something that you love uh, and make sure that you're creating a public home for your assertions. You're not going to be able to share them if you don't put them out somewhere. I've seen some really great options uh, where people have integrations with GitHub, and you can find those tools. There have been some presentations on it here. Uh, and then we also offer up RareMIO. Uh, and then create realistic expectations. The hardest thing about a dynamic collection is when it starts to grow. Uh, too big to be manageable or too big to be uh, movable. And you're always going to want to uh, stay as focused as you can. The nice thing about a dynamic collection is if I want to go back into any of those data entries and add another field, I can just do it. Uh, and that field is added automatically. By being non-destructive with the original, I can also drop off a field that I no longer want to render. And then browsable is best. I've never found a way to get around the missing dates of missing information. And if you just scrape a site or a handful of sites and bring together 3,000 things, 
and think that you're going to be able to search uh, just by what's in the label, uh, you're not even going to have labels that are all in the same language. So uh, being able to find a good way to move through the data in the collection and have a story for how the user is using it uh, creates the best opportunity. Uh, that's my presentation. I don't see QA. I will go through the chat and uh, answer anything that I see in there uh, after this presentation. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. Really, yeah, really rich set of stuff. Um, exactly as you said, it'd be great um, to, to take a look through the chat and the, the Q&A. That'll be available even after we end this. Um, so I'll say um, thanks again, Patrick, for the presentation. Thanks, folks, for joining us. Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll see you at future future presentations here. Thanks, folks.